Hello, and welcome to Moments in History. I'm Linda Shenton Matchett, author, speaker, and history geek. While researching my stories, I unearthed tons of intriguing information that doesn't end up in my books. So I've created this channel to share those tidbits with you. I really appreciate you stopping by to watch. During World War II, the American military underwent a massive personnel expansion. In 1939, there were only 174,000 men serving in the Army. By the end of 1942, there were 5,400,000. In 1943, there were 7 million. And by the end of the war, there were 8,300,000 men. Naval strength increased by 1,400,000 sailors. Needless to say, it was a huge challenge to equip and organize the rapidly growing force, and despite the government's understanding of the morale-boosting potential of good reading material, supplying books to military camp libraries simply could not be an immediate priority. Congress allocated money for buying new books, but the process was slow, and distribution was limited to bases with new construction. Three organizations stepped in to fill the void. During the month of November 1941, the American Library Association, the American Red Cross, and the United Service Organizations formed the Victory Book Campaign, originally named the National Defense Book Campaign. This nationwide campaign's goal was for the public to donate books as reading material for soldiers and sailors serving in the armed forces and supplement the Army and Navy's library service already in place. The first director was Althea Hester Warren, librarian of the Los Angeles Public Library. In the one sense, the campaign was wildly successful. Nearly 11 million books were donated. However, over 5 million were unusable for various reasons. Eventually, the cost of shipping and the unsuitability of bulky hardcover books made the project untenable. Fortunately for the troops, a publishing program for the troops was launched in the spring of 1943. The Council of Books in Wartime, or the CBW as it came to be called, was a nonprofit organization founded by booksellers, publishers, libraries, authors, and others in an effort to channel the use of books as quote unquote weapons in the war of ideas. The organization's motto. The idea was somewhat propaganda-ish in that they hoped to build and maintain the will to win, expose the true nature of the enemy, disseminate technical information, clarify war aims and problems of peace, in addition to providing that relaxation and inspiration. Although the CBF, CBW cooperated with the Office of War Information and other government agencies, it was a voluntary, unpaid, non-governmental organization. In collaboration with graphic artist H. Stanley Thompson and the publisher and CWB executive Malcolm Johnson, Lieutenant Colonel Raymond Troutman, head of the Army's library section, proposed his idea of Armed Services Edition. Mass-produced paperbacks selected by a panel of literary experts from among classics, bestseller, humor books, and poetry. The support of William Warder Norton, chairman of the CWB's executive committee and president of the publishing house W. W. Norton, was instrumental for the project to be realized, and ultimately over 70 publishers and a dozen printing houses collaborated on the ASCs. The CBW appointed Philip Van Doren Stern, a printing expert and a former Pocket Books executive, as project manager. The voluntary advisory panel that selected the books comprised notable figures from publishing and literature. Its initial members were John C. Farrar, William Sloan, Gene Flexner, Nicholas Rendon, Mark Van Doren, Amy Loveman, and Harry Hansen. The panel met twice weekly, selecting publications from among the publisher's suggestions. It aimed at publishing 50 bucks per month, but soon reduced that goal to 30. The panel mainly focused on selecting recreational reading material, both fiction and nonfiction, primarily drawn from current publication and aiming at all levels of taste within quote-unquote reasonable limits. The order of publication was chosen at random by pulling names out of, get this, a cookie jar. The first book printed was The Education of Hyman Kaplan 
by Leo Rostin. Interestingly, the ASC series was free from official government censorship, but the Army and Navy chief librarians, Troutman and Isabel Dubois respectively, made sure that all books were acceptable in both services. And they rejected works with statements or attitudes offensive to our allies, any religious or racial group, or not in accord with the spirit of American democracy. Distribution of ASEs began in October of 1943 and continued until 1947. The books were issued to soldiers overseas, such as in hospitals or on transports, and or airdropped as part of the supplies destined for remote outposts. Notably, just before the invasion of Normandy, a mass distribution of ASE titles took place among the troops marshaled in southern England, and each man received a book as he embarked on his invasion transport. Ultimately, 1,324 titles were distributed, and over 122 million copies were printed, making this one of the largest wide-scale distribution of free books in history. Of the 1,324 titles, 1,225 were unique titles. 99 were reprints of titles issued earlier in the series. There were 63 collections that were comprised of short stories, poems, essays, plays, and radio plays. The titles printed were abridged, usually for length rather than content. Those bore the slogan, Condensed for Wartime Reading, or slight variations such as Slightly Convinced for Rapid Reading. A huge array of fiction and nonfiction titles included classics, contemporary bestsellers, biographies, drama, poetry, and genre fiction, such as mystery, sports, fantasy, action adventure, and westerns. As mentioned, most of the books were unabridged version. Authors included Robert Benchley, Stephen Vincent Benet, Max Brand, Joseph Conrad, William Faulkner, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Earl Stanley Gardner, Zane Gray, Jack London, Yago Marsh, W. Somerset Maugham, Edgar Allan Poe, Percy Bysshe Shelley, John Steinbeck, Bram Stoker, James Thurber, Mark Twain, and H.G. Wells. The covers were thumbnails of the original hardcover jacket image and carried a list of other ASC titles released that month. The distinctive covers bore the description, Armed Services Edition. This is a complete book, not a digest. And you'll see that on the bottom here on this version of Great Sun by Edna Ferber. The books were printed on digest and pulp magazine presses, usually in two columns per page for easier reading. Some ASEs were stapled along the binding, in addition to being glued, making them sturdier. Because the Council on Books in Wartime made use of magazine presses to print the ASEs when the presses weren't in use, printing costs were very, very low, the cost usually hovering around six cents per copy, and royalties of one cent per copy were split between author and publisher. This early experiment with mass paperback printing helped prove the viability of paperback publishing in the U.S. The small books were convenient for soldiers because they fit easily into a cargo pocket. The finished size varied from five and a half to six and a half long and three and seven eighths inch to four and a half inch uh, high. Unlike traditional paperbacks, most of the ASCs were bound on the short side of the text block rather than the long side due to the printing presses used. A few titles near the end of the series were published in traditional paperback format with the spine on the long side. According to soldiers, the ASCs are as popular as pinup girls or that to heave one in the garbage can is tantamount to striking your grandmother. One sailor reported that a man was considered out of uniform if a book isn't sticking out of the hip pocket. One incredulous Marine is said to have begun reading Herman Melville's Type E out of boredom and was delighted to discover that this guy wrote about the three islands I'd been on. Authors received voluminous fan mail from the front lines, such as this note to Leo Rostin. I want to thank you profoundly for myself, and more important, for the men here in this godforsaken part of, globe, of the globe. Last week, we received your book on Mr. Kaplan. As an experiment, I read it one night at the campfire, 
The men howled. Now they demand I read only one Kaplan story a night, a ration on pleasure. Authors who served overseas took particular pride in the inclusion of their books. David Ewen, Men of Popular Music and the Story of George Gershwin, served in the armed forces during the war and said he knew only too well what a solace the books could be. I myself, not then being too long a civilian, remember my pride at seeing the small paperback edition and think of it going out to beguile the time of soldiers and sailors, said novelist Herman Woke about his work, Aurora Dawn. For many men who hadn't read a book since high school, the impact of their monthly book allowance was life-changing. The ASCs formed a lifelong habit of reading for many and changed their perspective on education. Reading a book seemed to ceased to seem like a difficult or dull task. And when the GI Bill made a college education available for many, a generation of men were ready to take advantage, growing the middle class and making the post-war consumer boom possible. Looking through the lists of ASCs published, it's fascinating to see which novels have subsequently sunk into obscurity and which were catapulted into canonical status through being so widely read. For example, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby was an ASC, and its post-war rise to the great American novel status is partially credited to this. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn similarly remains an American classic, while once popular books like Chicken Every Sunday and Strange Fruit and authors like Catherine Ann Porter and war correspondent Ernie Pyle are relatively unknown outside of academic and book collecting circles. The Library of Congress holds one of only a few complete sets that survive today. Author Irving Stone, whose works Lust for Life and Immortal Wife were part of this collection as well. How better to inspire the troops to victory. I hope you've enjoyed today's moment in history. If you want to learn even more history, please stop by my blog found on my website, www.lindashentonmatchett.com. And please consider subscribing to my channel and click the bell icon to receive notifications of new episodes that generally release on the second and fourth Fridays of each month. You now have the opportunity to partner with me in my author journey through Patreon and receive exclusive benefits not available anywhere else. Depending on the level of support that you choose, you get to read along as I write, obtain advanced copies of ebooks or signed paperbacks, and attend live monthly chats. You might even get to name a character. So head on over to my page, found at patreon.com forward slash Linda Shenton Matchett, for more information. That's p a t r e o n dot com forward slash Linda Shenton Matchett. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.